Welcome to the ninth lecture. Today we will be focusing our attention into the main memory systems. Typically we call main memory systems as DRAM as well. We have seen how a cache memory works and what are the various techniques which are used to improve the performance of cache memory, basically abbreviated as cache memory optimization techniques. Now we have to understand since cache memory is very small, the entire program and data of a given application cannot be located fully inside cache memory. And we have learned that our memory is implemented as a hierarchy where we have the registers inside the processor as the fastest memory, then we have multiple levels of cache L1, L2 and then we move on to the next level of memory which is known as the main memory or it is also known as DRAM system. We will try to understand what is the organization of DRAM and how the what is the working principle and what are the controlled circuitry that is associated with the DRAM system known as the DRAM controller. This diagram shows you the, the structure of a motherboard and how various uh, units are going to be connected into this motherboard. This is an area where the CPU is kept or we also known as CPU socket and on top of this we will have the CPU fans. We have various ports that are used for connecting the peripheral devices including the network port and parallel and serial port, USB ports, mouse and keyboard, audio jackets, all other things. And uh, we have this is the area in which the DRAM system is connected or it is also known as DDR memory slots. We can see that there are two bridges, one is known as the north bridge and uh, the other one is known as south bridge. So north bridge and south bridge are the two connection points in which high end devices and low end devices are appropriately connected in the system. So in short your motherboard is going to house your processor chip and on top of that the uh, heat sink fans are being connected and then we have slots for connecting the peripheral devices including uh, the hard disk and uh, then we have separate slot wherein the DRAM slots are being kept, the DRAM DIMMs are being kept and there are two bridges which are appropriately connecting high end and low end devices to processors. Let us try to understand a more logical picture of this. This is the way how CPU and the first level caches and second level caches are hosted inside the CPU chip and then these are the DRAM modules. So typically DRAM is kept outside the chip and then we have your hard disk and peripheral devices plus the network, network interface is there and south bridge is uh, uh, the interface point at which hard disk and other peripheral devices are being connected and north bridge, so south bridge is connecting to north bridge and relatively high end devices like main memory, graphics core processor are all connected to the north bridge chipset. So what we try to uh, learn from uh, this block diagram perspective is CPU is operating at relatively very high speed. Compared to the speed of CPU, the peripheral devices and hard disk which are basically electromechanical in nature will be operating at a milliseconds level at least a couple of order of magnitude difference is there in its operation speed. So to interface easily with the high end CPU, the peripheral devices are connected through south bridge and then relatively faster devices like uh, DRAM system which are the semiconductor memories, they are connected through the north bridge. So south bridge is connecting to north bridge, all peripheral devices and hard disk are connected to south bridge and all the semiconductor memories, the core processors, graphics pro core processors all are connected to north bridge and then the north bridge is the primary interface point to uh, the processor. Now, our today's lecture is going to focus about how this DRAM system is going to work. This is how typically a DRAM unit looks like, it is also known as a DIMM and this is the layout of uh, the recent multi-core processor by Intel. So what you see here is you have many cores that is inside a single chip. So what you see here is basically a chip, processor chip and within this chip we have 
various cores. In this example, we have four cores, core 0, core 1, core 2 and core 3. The primary cache or the L1 cache is inside the core. The L2 caches are kept near to the core, that is the L2 cache for core 1, L2 cache for core 0, 2 and 3 and then you have a shared L3 cache. Now, what you see here is the DRAM banks, you have the DRAM system and this is the DRAM interface. So, processor is going to control the DRAM through the DRAM interface or it is also known as the DRAM controller. Now, let us try to understand for your main memory system there are two choices, either you have to use an SRAM which is known as static RAM and the other one is known as dynamic RAM, DRAM. We will briefly touch upon the properties and characteristics of SRAM and DRAM and we will try to conclude why we prefer DRAM over SRAM in implementation of the main memory system. This is how an SRAM cell looks like. This cell can store one bit of information and we have a row line that is what you see in this green color and you have a bit line what you see in this blue color and you have a pair of bit lines for storage of every bit, one is bit line and one is bit line complement. Bit line complement is always or bit line bar is always carrying the negated value which is stored in this bit line. We have two cross coupled NOT gates connected by two transistors. So, we have two transistors T1 and T2 which are connected to the row select. So, once this particular row is selected, both T1 and T2 is going to be in on position. So, whatever value is there in the bit line, it flows into the NOT gates and here you have two points X and Y. So, X will store the value that is there in the bit line. So, just to summarize, whenever we wanted to write a binary value 1 into an SRAM, the row is selected thereby two transistors will be in on mode. The transistors will conduct whatever is the value in the bit line into the NOT gates. So, the value in the bit line will pass through the transistor and will reach point x and y is always complement of x. So, through this NOT gates this value keep on so circulating, x will store your value and y will store the complement of this value. So, for a very short time this transistor is activated and then this value is get uh, stored or stuck inside these two cross coupled NOT gates. Similarly, if you wanted to perform a read operation, again the word line is activated. Once the word line is activated, the, the value that is stored in point x will move to this bit line. So, it is like with one direction that is in the case of a store operation or a write operation, the value in the bit line passes to the transistor and reach the input of the NOT gate or point x. If it is a read operation, the value that is stored in the x will transfer to the bit line through the transistor. So, transistor basically act as a switch in this context. Now, how will you implement larger SRAMs? We have to order whatever binary cell you have seen. This binary cell consists of two transistors and uh, two NOT gates and one NOT gate is implemented using two transistors. So, altogether we have two transistors which act as switching elements and we have four transistors that are used to implement the NOT gate. So, these B cells which each of the B cell consists of six transistors. These are organized as the rows and columns such that you get a organized structure for your main memory and you have to generate an address. The address consists of two components that is N bits which will represent the row and M bits which will represent the column. So, you, when you have an address say example 10 bits, we can divide into 5 and 5, 5 bits for row and 5 bits for column. The most significant 5 bits will uniquely choose one of the row. So, you are using an n to 2 power n decoder and once that row is selected, the entire contents of this row gets transferred to a sense amplifier and then you apply your column bits. So, one of the bit is going to be extracted. So, you get 2 power m values is going to come and when you apply m, one of the value will come out. This is how you organize a binary cell and from the binary cell we are going to extract the values. So, in the case of a reading operation you have to first decode the address. So, address is been split up into a row and columns and then you using the row decoder the appropriate row is selected and selected bit cells drive the bit lines. The entire row value is read together and then you apply the column select so that you will get this value. 
So, to summarize what is the basic operation of an SRAM or how SRAM is been built, SRAM is built with the help of two cross coupled NOT gates and two transistors and we have a word line and a bit line. Once the word line is activated, the transistor will act like a short circuit or an on position and then the values will flow from bit line into the trans into the NOT gate and your values are stored there. And multiple such bit lines are being organized or combined together in order to form a B cell array. Now, let us try to see how DRAM is implemented. The implementation of DRAM is slightly different. The number of components used to store a 1 bit value is very less here. We are making use of one transistor and one capacitor in order to store a single binary cell value. So, bits are basically stored as charges on the capacitor and a B cell lose charge when you read. So, essentially you have a capacitor and when you are going to charge the capacitor or when there exists a potential difference between the parallel plates of a capacitor, we call it as logic 1. And when the potential difference between the two parallel plates of a capacitor is less than a threshold value, then we call it as logic 0. So, if the capacitor is charged, that means a value 1 is stored there. If the capacitor is not charged, then the value 0 is being stored there. But the property of this capacitor is, when you are trying to read a data, then capacitor discharges. So, if there is sufficient amount of potential that get discharged, then the sense amplifier knows that the value that was stored in the capacitor was 1. Since the charge is already lost, a reading, a B cell will lose charge when you read. Because of the leakage property of the capacitor, whenever you are not doing anything also, over a period of time, the capacitor loses the charge. So, since we are going to implement your 1s and zeros as charges over parallel plates of a capacitor, any reading will discharge the capacitor and the capacitor discharges over time due to decay property as well. Now, you have a flip flopping sense amplifier that amplifies and regenerates the bit line and data bit is multiplexed out of it. You can see from this diagram that you are going to use a 4 bit address out of which 2 bits are used to uniquely select a row. So, consider a case that this particular row is selected. Once the row is selected, the transistor that you see there, all the transistors will be in on position. That means, they will permit whatever is the value in the corresponding bit lines. These are the bit lines. The corresponding bit lines will flow and uh, the charges get stored in the capacitor. That is a process of storing something. Now, when you wanted to read, what you have to do is again activate the appropriate word line, the capacitor discharges. So, if the capacitor already has a high potential between its parallel plate, the sense amplifier will get voltage, thereby it recognizes that the value that was stored on the B cell was 1. If there is no discharge that is happening, that means already there is no charge between the parallel plates, meaning that the value that is stored there is 0. So, a brief comparison between DRAM and SRAM. DRAM is relatively slower because in order to know what is the value that is stored across a capacitor, we have to permit the capacitor to discharge. So, the discharging time of capacitor is not under electronic timing. So, it is slightly a slower axis. But it is having high density that makes it suitable for large memory systems like our present day main memory. Only one transistor and one capacitor cell is required, thereby making its implementation a lower cost affair. Because of the leakage property of the capacitor, you requires a refresh circuitry that is power hungry and uh, it will affect the performance as well. So, and the manufacturing requires a bit of extra uh, overhead because you are going to put a logic that is a semiconductor logic and a capacitor going to be put together. Moving on to SRAM, since there is no capacitor that is involved, all the components are electronic components because we have only transistors accessing from an SRAM is relatively faster and it is having low density because to store one bit, I require 6 transistors, thereby making it of higher cost of air. Since there is no capacitor that is involved, there is no component that is having a leakage property, no refreshing is required and 
manufacturing is compatible because all the units are basically your semiconductor logic there is no capacitor that is involved this is the basic difference because of the higher density we are going to make use because your main memory should have really large size of the order of gigabytes and the chip should be small enough so that i can accommodate it in the motherboard so the high density make our main memory system to be built with capacitors and transistors so dram system is basically used in order to implement the primary memory of current day processors let us now try to see before going into the implementation structure of dram we will try to understand what is the principle of interleaving and what is the role of interleaving or what why we should understand the concept of interleaving before designing a dram system the interleaving is also known as banking the problem that we face is when you have a single monolithic memory array it takes lot of time to access them because you have a bulk of uh, memory and then you have one decoder let's say you are going to use a 4 gb of memory which is organized as a single monolithic unit this 4 gb memory to address it we require 32 bits so we have a 32 2 power 32 decoder that will uniquely identify one of these bits memory locations so that will take relatively longer access so in order and it's not possible to have two parallel access together because you have only one decoder so the goal while going for banking or interleaving is reducing the latency of memory array access and enable multiple access in parallel how it is done divide the array into multiple banks rather than keeping your 4 gb as a single monolithic unit i can divide them into 1 gb into 4 so the entire 4 gb of your main memory is divided into 1 gb structures similarly we have four such 1 gb structures and these 1 gb structures can be accessed parallelly so divide the entire memory into multiple banks that can be accessed independently either in the same cycle or in consecutive cycle so each bank is smaller than the entire memory storage and access to different banks so whenever we are accessing one bank we can access or we can make necessary facilities such that i can access the other bank immediately after the data transfer of the current bank is over but the key design issue is how do you map data to different banks so this is the principle by which the interleaving works now how will you handle multiple access per cycle so this dram is going to be acting as a primary memory structure for all processors and cache we are already in multi core environment where multiple processors works parallelly with their own private and shared caches and there is high possibility that these processors will have their own cache misses reaching to dram maybe at the same time or in short how will the dram manage when multiple memory requests are going to come to dram so what is done in the case of the interleaving is address space is partitioned into separate banks so whatever is the existing storage that is been partitioned into separate banks and bits in the address let's say it's a most significant bit or the least significant bits or somewhere in middle bits these bits will tell you whether you belong to bank 1 bank 2 or bank 3 like that one simple way of implementing banking is what is given in this diagram all the even addresses can be considered as mapped to bank 0 and all the odd addresses can be considered as mapped to bank 1 so when you have two requests that is coming let's say one of the request is for an even address that is ending with 0 then the data is physically located in your bank 0 in this case let's say the other request that is coming at this point is an odd address that is the least significant bit of the address is 1 and it, it will be located in bank 1 so if you have two read write ports and the addresses of our uh, the dram access are belonging to two different banks independently i can service them but we cannot satisfy multiple access that are to the same bank so we will use a crossbar kind of a structure depending on address whether it's go to bank 0 or bank 1 both in the output and in the input structure two access that are to the same bank are been termed as bank conflicts so whenever there exists a bank conflict between two address the meaning is 
two addresses are mapped to the same bank. So, we cannot handle such cases. Moving further, DRAM consists of a paged mode structure. A DRAM bank is a 2D array of cells which consists of rows and columns and we keep a sense amplifier at the row buffers and each address is basically a row and a column pair. Now, there are two terminologies that we will tell. So, one is known as closed row, the other one is known as open row. So, we have learned that your DRAM consists of rows and columns. There can be a case like when you give an address, the row is no longer existing in the row buffer. So, first we have to take the entire contents of a row into the row buffer, then give the column bits such that we can extract the data. A scenario where a given row is not already kept in the row buffer is known as a closed row scenario. So, whenever you have a closed row scenario, first you have to give an activate command such that the appropriate row is placed onto the row buffer and then you have a read or write command such that the appropriate column from the row buffer is chosen. And this precharge command closes a row and prepare the bank for next access. Since we have learned that in the case of a DRAM structure, when you give a read operation, the contents of the capacitor have been discharging through the bit line and reaching row buffer, so that now this capacitor are no longer charged. This is called a destructive read. Any read operation that you carry out on a capacitor will discharge the charges that exist over the capacitor plates leading to a zero potential there. So, any reading will exactly delete the value that is stored, the logic that is stored there. So, at the, and the values are now there in the row buffer. If I wanted to activate a new row buffer, the existing value that is there in the row buffer should be stored back such that my corresponding row capacitors are now storing the value again. The operation of storing the contents in the row buffer back to the appropriate row is known as precharge. There are three basic operation that is involved. The first one is known as activate where the contents of row are moved to the row buffer. The second one is known as precharge where the contents of row buffer are going back to the appropriate row. And then we have a read or write command which is also known as column address strobe where your data is already available in row buffer, give the corresponding column address and that will tell you what data is to be extracted. Now, once you have an address which is already open, that means the corresponding row is already open, you need not give an activate command, only a read or a write command is needed. Let us try to understand a DRAM bank operation. We have seen that the DRAM consists of rows and columns and we have a row buffer. Now, depending on the addresses that are coming, we have to see that how this row buffer is getting populated. Initially, the row buffer is empty as you see from the diagram. Let us say CPU is going to give an address row 0 and column 0. So, first we give row 0 there. So, the contents of row 0 are activated such that the contents of row 0 will reach the row buffer. So, now the row buffer is currently holding row 0. Give the column number. So, the sequence is first you give the row number, the contents of the entire row will reach the row buffer. Give the column number. So, here column address is 0. So, the 0 address is being taken off. So, the data will move from the row buffer. So, once you give the column address 0, the 0th column's value, that particular data will get transferred from the row buffer over the column multiplexer to the data bus. Let us say the very next request that CPU gives is a row 0 column 1. Here the row is already there in the row buffer and we call the scenario as a row hit. Once you have a row hit, then there is no need to give an activate command because already the row is there. Give the column address. So, here column address number is 1. So, the contents of 1 are being getting transferred. Let us now consider a third address that is coming to CPU from the CPU into the DRAM, row 0 and column 85. This is also a raw hit because row 0 
is already there inside the row buffer. So, we only need to give the column address, column address 85, the contents of the 85th column is being transferred. Now, we get a scenario where CPU is going to give row 1 and column 0. So, whatever is the row that is kept open in the row buffer is different from the row address of the incoming address. This scenario is known as conflict. It is known as row buffer conflict because the requested row is different from the existing row in the row buffer. So, in this case, the value from the row buffer has to be stored back and that process is known as pre-charge. So, the contents of row 0 which was already there in row buffer is being transferred back into the corresponding row. So, at the time of activation of row 0, now the capacitors no longer hold the data, only the row buffer has it. So, before the row buffer is going to get loaded with a new row, existing values have to be stored back. So, now I am going to give activate command for row address 1. So, the row 1 will come, apply the column address. So, column address 0 will get transferred into this. We will now look into the organization of the DRAM. DRAM itself is consisting of multiple hierarchy, consisting of channels, DIM, rank, chip, bank, row, columns and B cells. We will try to see what each one of them is. So, when you have a processor, the processor may have multiple channels, means it may have multiple controllers and multiple channels is also known as multiple address buses or data buses. So, if a processor has n set of buses, then typically it has n channels. So, this is one channel and the other one, this is one channel and the other one is going to be the second channel. So, this is memory channel number 1 and uh, channel number 1 and this is channel number 2. So, two channels are there and each of this channel consists of multiple DIMMs. So, what do you see is a structure here that is called a DIMM. The entire structure is known as a channel. So, here I have two channels and each channel has two DIMM. So, typical structure what you see as main memory is known as multiple DIMM is known as a single DIMM. This is what is a DIMM. I can create multiple such DIMMs and put together in one DRAM slot. Now, once you reach a DIMM, the DIMM has a front side and it has a back side. So, front side and back side is there. This is how a DIMM looks like. The, the front side is known as rank 0 and the back side is known as rank 1. Now, you take a rank. When you give it as a rank, you are going to give it a common address to a rank and either rank 0 or rank 1 will give the corresponding data that you need. Now, each of the rank that you take, let us say this rank is going to supply to a 64 bits of data to me, we can consider that this rank consists of 8 chips with numbering 0 to 7 each chip is going to give a small fragment of the entire 64 bit. I have total 64 bit of data that has to move through the data bus, out of which chip 0 will give me bit 0 to bit 7, chip 1 will give me bit 8 to bit 15, like that chip 7 will retrieve me bit 56 to bit 63. So, in short, your rank is going to give total of 64 bits and these 64 bits are not generated from a single chip. There are 8 chips that is being kept. Each chip will give a sub component of the entire 64 bit data. So, the data that is given by 8 chips together will form 64 bit of data. Now, if you take each chip, let us say this is the first chip, each chip is going to retrieve me 7 bits, but I have a 3D structure now and that is known as banks. So, each chip consists of multiple layer of such kind of rows and columns and together that 3D structure is known as bank. Now, breaking down a bank 
each bank consists of rows as well as columns. So, what we have seen is the given DRAM address, this address should mention to which channel it belongs to, to which DIM it belongs to. So, channel consists of multiple DIMs, a DIM consists of multiple ranks, typically two ranks, rank 0 that is the front side of the DIM and rank 1 that is the back side of the DIM two ranks and each rank consists of multiple chips and each of the chip will contribute a fraction of the big data that is going to be transmitted through the data bus. And each of this chip further has a three dimensional layering on it and that is known as banks. So, if you have eight layers of storage inside each chip, we call it as an eight bank DRAM system. Now, looking into each of these bank, we can see rows and columns and the meeting point of rows and columns will give you one bit of information. So, what is typically a DRAM rank? Rank is a set of chips that respond to the same command and same address at the same time, but with different pieces of requested data. Like what we can see, you are giving a common command here and this entire structure is known as a rank. This rank consists of four chips with chips numbered as chip 0, 1, 2 and 3. Once you give a command, each of the chip will return say 8 bit of data and together adding up all these 8 bits, we will be getting 32 bits of data. So, in short, rank consists of a set of chips that respond to the same command and same address at the same time but with different pieces of requested data. So, the peculiarity of the chip is each chip is going to give a different piece of data for the given address. So, it is an easy to produce 8 bit chip rather than 32 bit chip. So, each chip will generate only 8 bits and the organization is in such a way that at the end you will get the 32 bit data together. So, produce an 8 bit chip, but control and operate them as a rank together to get a 32 bit data in a single read. This is how the organization is going to be, you can see that this is what you see it as a rank and the rank consists of 8 chips, that is what we see here, 8 chips are there and whatever is a command or address you give, the same command and address will goes to all the 8 chips, each of the 8 bit is going, each of the chip is going to return with 8 bit data and together we will be getting a 64 bit data out. And looking deeper into each of the chip, we can see that there are 8 banks, it is a 3D structure and the meeting point of banks, within these banks we have rows and columns and then you have row buffer, each bank has its own row buffer. So, depending on the addresses, we will be able to extract the data from the appropriate row buffer. So, there can be row hits as well as row conflicts and DRAM access latency varies depending on which row is stored in row buffer. Now, we try to correlate with the principle of interleaving that we have already learnt. In the concept of interleaving, we are telling, if two addresses are coming to different banks and if you have multiple read write ports, it can be easily handled, means I could have achieved parallelism. Similarly, if two requests that is coming to the DRAM system is belonging to two different banks, so that I can activate two banks parallelly, I can record this data by the appropriate activate command, the data of the corresponding row will reach the row buffer and from the row buffer you give the column address and once the column address is ready, I can extract the data. But if you have only one data channel, only one data bus that is available, I cannot give the read or write signal together but I can always keep my row buffer ready with the appropriate data such that once data transfer is over in bank 1, data transfer operations are ready in bank 2, so that bus is continuously occupied. Now, we will try to see how a transferring that happens inside a cache block. So, when you have a physical memory, this is the logical view of the physical memory whatever we have seen and this is how the physical organization of the DRAM structure. Consider that from this main memory, you are going to have to transfer 64 byte cache block. 
if that means any data that is moving from main memory into cache memory is of the size 64 byte, my cache block size is 64 bytes. So, how am I going to extract these 64 bytes? 64 bytes cannot be taken together. Where is the 64 byte located inside my main memory? So, consider this case, you have a cache memory block size of 64 bytes. So, when cache memory requests for a word, it is typically a block of size 64 bytes is getting transferred and this is how the data comes. First I give row 0 and column 0. So, across all the chips, row 0 and column 0 is selected and this is going to give me 1 byte of information that is 8 bit. Each one is going to give me 8 bit of information or exactly 1 byte of information. So, at the end, I am going to get 8 bytes of information. Chip 0 will return 8 bit chip 1 will return 8 bit. Similarly, chip 7 is also going to return 8 bits. Each of them is a byte. So, altogether I have 8 chips, 8 bytes of data. So, I got 8 bytes of data. Next, I will appropriately increment the columns. So, the row buffer of bank 0 of chip 0 will carry this first 8 bits. Similarly, the contents of chip 1 that is row 0 of chip 1 bank 1 will store the value in, in the corresponding row buffer. So, every row buffer across bank 0 of all the chips will carry the corresponding row and then you vary across the column number. So, once you put column number 1, you get 8 bits each and these 8 bits together will constitute my next 8 bytes making it 16 bytes. Similarly, I have to carry out this operation. So, a 64 byte cache block takes 8 IO cycles to transfer. So, during this process, 8 columns are read sequentially. So, even though we consider main memory as a linear unit, today we have seen that the main memory is organized as channels, DIMMs, ranks, chips and banks and then followed by rows and columns. So, when you wanted to transfer a block of data to cache memory, it is not coming from a single point. First, we give a row and column that will give you 8 bytes of data. These 8 bytes of data are transferred together because your 8 bytes mean 64 bits. Let us say your data bus width is 64 bit. That means from main memory to cache memory, only 64 bits can flow at a time. 64 bits will travel together and then that is what you get. Once you get your 64 bit, then your first set of data is ready. That is 8 byte is ready. But for the cache memory to continue its operation, one entire block has to come. Only 8 byte out of the 64 byte block has reached. So, I have to bring another 7 more IO cycles. So, increment the column number. So, the row is already there. The row are raw hits. Increment the column number. Transfer the next 8 bytes. Increment the column bit by one more. Transfer the next 8 bytes. Like that, you require 8 such IO cycles in order to complete the operation. So, with this, we come to the end of today's this lecture, where we have learned about what is the basic structure of a DRAM, the difference between SRAM and DRAM, and how basically DRAM is organized into multiple hierarchy consisting from channels up to the rows and columns. And basically, with the help of an example, we saw how cache memory block copying happens from the DRAM. The next day, we will try to see that how a DRAM controller is working and how address mappings are done on the DRAM structure. Feel free to post if you have any queries. Thank you very much for the day. Mm -hmm.